In this brief, very brief talk, I will tell you about my experience, uh, not as a teacher, not as a professor, but as a consultant uh, dealing with uh, surgeons, uh, uh, radiologists, nurses in this building. That is the Orthopedic Institute uh, Galeazzi in Milan. It is one of the three research hospitals of a very big private uh, healthcare group, Gruppo San Donato, that in Italy uh, treats every year almost 4 million people. And this is one of the reasons why this group uh, is quite keen on uh, machine learning uh, systems and uh, uh, so clinical decision support systems. But the other reason is that uh, in, uh, in this hospital, there are also many university teachers uh, and many university students uh, trying to uh, improve medicine and trying also to get published because uh, these kind of hospitals get also reimbursement uh, according to the impact factor point they, they gain every year. So most of the people with whom I have been working in the last times, uh, um, medical uh, people and also data scientists and uh, statisticians and computer scientists uh, usually are positive with respect to machine learning capabilities. Here I'm just referring to one uh, book that has been uh, recently translated also in Italian that is quite positive uh, on the fact that this system could change our economy, our culture, and so that people are not needed anymore. Obviously, just a provocation, but they also... Some other people are a little bit wary of the actual performance, so they are more technically sided of the machine learning systems, like, for example, the authors of this quite influential book on big data. And very few people, I mean among the people with whom I work, are, seri are seriously worried about the more or less far consequences of the use of these systems uh, in human work and specifically in medicine. I don't know if you know this book, it is quite uh, uh, recent, uh, it was written two years ago, I, I believe, and it has not yet uh, translated in, uh, in Italian, it is about uh, machine learning systems and big data systems uh, considered as weapons uh, of mass destruction, and I suggest it if you are interested in these topics. So I like the Socratic way uh, to, to address problems, that is not to give answers, but rather to frame the problem first, and also to, to challenge people with uh, open questions. So the first question that um, I tackled in my, in my work at that uh, healthcare facility is, uh, is like this one. If uh, machine learning is so effective and accurate in diagnostic and prognostic uh, decisions, uh, why do not computer scientists invest more effort in this field? And why uh, they don't feel pressed to invest uh, on, uh, on saving lives? There is a, um, a report by the uh, IOS, the Institute of Medicine, an American institute, uh, 10 years ago, no, 15 years ago, claiming that 100,000 people just in the United States die for preventable errors by doctors every year. So this is quite an important uh, challenge to address, and I wonder why we're not so much so more keen on, this, uh, on these methods. And a related question is, why health informatics uh, is not important as much uh, as other uh, fields in computer science? And my personal opinion is that it is one of the most neglected. And if you could object that actually is not, I, I consider health informatics different from artificial intelligence in medicine because it's a field more related on how to embed, uh, how to intertwine uh, the social and the technical uh, uh, elements uh, of the reality, what has been dubbed the uh, uh, soft wire systems in uh, the, the talk by Marilyn that I really enjoyed. So uh, the challenge is how to integrate artificial intelligence, intelligence augmentation systems, and also humans, so that healthcare can improve over time. And the last question is, why there isn't a mechanical medicine that is taught at medical schools, like there is a nuclear medicine, or a medical computation, just like there is a medical imaging? Sorry for the title. 
there is like a mismatch between the results that the scholars are claiming about these systems and the impact that these systems can have on real life. And if you object that medical doctors should not care about data and algorithms because this would mean that they steal our job, I believe that any human use of uh, technologies that are so powerful like machine learning uh, should entail also to empower end users in a more aware uh, use of these uh, uh, systems so that uh, they can open up the black box these systems in, in some way look like. So there is a, the last question that I pose to myself, that I ask myself and I toss in the discussion. What are the unintended consequences of deploying accurate, and I stress accurate, machine learning system, systems in medicine? Um, I, I dubbed these uh, the main, I detected the three main uh, uh, classes of uh, unintended consequences, but I'm sure there are ma many more, and this research is just at the beginning, and also in the United States where the expression, the phrase uh, unintended consequences was uh, coined uh, 10 years ago, this research has not uh, grown up uh, mature in a way. Um, in some way, that there is no, uh, um, um, a relevant discussion, debate on these unintended consequences. I'm just beginning to, to address them, at least in the facility where I'm working. I call them semiotic desensitization, empirical sclerosis, and over-reliance. In the abstract that I sent to the organizers of this uh, interesting workshop, I also um, detailed, <coughs> I distinguished between over-dependence and over-confidence, and obviously I will uh, go quite uh, quite fast on this uh, concept, uh, over-dependence uh, regards uh, the fact that people using uh, smart systems, machine learning enabled systems, could just forget how they were used to work before their, uh, <coughs> their deployment, so that they could uh, uh, risk to, to forget how to uh, implement any plan B they would <coughs> substitute the intelligent system if it, it, it fails, if it goes down. So it regards a lack of autonomy, of concrete uh, actual autonomy by the, um, the human people and also an abuse of the system. Maybe they just rely on the system more times than, the, than it is really necessary. And overconfidence is just g uh, these uh, three things, like thinking the system will never fail, because uh, power is always or almost always up and, uh, and we don't think it's probable someday, some hour, the system will break up, uh, thinking that it will never harm anyone and also, and more importantly, thinking that the system will never be wrong. It is related to the many of the topics that were treated in the talks before mine. The, the other main class of unintended consequences that I detected, uh, and uh, obviously I put on uh, the public discussion uh, is a semiotic desensitization. It is exactly what was told by uh, Marlene in an earlier talk about the fact that doctors are used to see numbers instead of uh, patients. And uh, if you think that this is uh, an argument at point that is too stretched, just think that they rely more and more often on examinations, on the results of lab exams, on uh, uh, codes and uh, categories that are chosen by other specialists. For example, a diagnosis can be seen just like a further code to the interpretation of um, a medical uh, general practitioner, for example. So the risk is that uh, they could uh, become uh, less and less sensitive to uh, the bodily, the concrete, the material signs uh, of the patients, uh, not leave alone uh, the symptoms that patients uh, could uh, report to them, uh, because they want to trust numbers, because the culture surrounding them uh, pushes them to believe to the quantified representations of patients that are stored and can be retrieved uh, from uh, uh, the patient records and the decision support tools. And the last one that I just uh, mentioned here is empirical uh, sclerosis. Uh, sclerosis is when you have an hardening of something that uh, should be uh, is supposed to be soft in a way. 
because as uh, most of you already know much, uh, much more than I, supervised machine learning techniques uh, can be seen as ways to learn the underlying, the hidden structure that binds empirical data observations, uh, that is features, uh, to their categorical interpretation, to an interpretation that was produced uh, by, by some observer in the past, that is classes. However, this structure could be seen as too stable, to be too rigid. It could freeze the, some, I, I have written always to some extent, uh, maybe it's a little bit uh, uh, extreme, but I really think that is the case, uh, arbitrary, unreliable, and peculiar, idiosyncratic mapping that uh, any observer, any human observer does between the sign and the data, the code, the, the diagnosis, for example, and between the data and the class, the classes that are managed by a computational system. And this relates to the inter-rater and intra-rater uh, agreement that uh, medical researcher has addressed since uh, the 20s of the last century, and it is uh, like an um, always neglected uh, topic, uh, both in medical literature and in the, um, our in the computer science literature addressing medical uh, uh, topics, so also called observer variability. Observers uh, could not agree with each other, and even with themselves after a while that they have interpreted the same sign, the same radiography, for example. So, just the last slide, uh, there is also um, a further uh, unintended consequence uh, that is complacency. In a way, uh, here I could uh, just start a brief uh, uh, excerpt from a, a sci-fi series that I loved when I was a kid, I still love, that is Star Trek. There is an episode where the computer uh, interprets uh, uh, I don't know if you know Star Trek, but anyway, there is uh, Captain Kirk that was aging in this episode uh, for a uh, uh, sort of disease that uh, he took uh, in, a, in an alien planet. And the computer decided that his age was uh, um, like uh, 72, but he claimed that he was just uh, 34. And uh, Spock asked Dr. McCoy, that was the doctor involved in uh, on the the Star Trek uh, uh, spaceship, uh, if uh, he agreed. And uh, he really didn't agree with the computer because obviously he knew uh, Captain Kirk was young and um, spoke, uh, uh, urged him to, uh, to, to agree with the computer because the computer could not be wrong in a way. And at the very end, McCoy uh, had to admit that uh, even if he was uh, aging and so he was a better man. Actually, he was really aging, even if uh, obviously Kirk was not, uh, uh, didn't agree with him. So in a way, also a very close friend of uh, uh, Captain Kirk, that is McCoy, had to com be compliant with the decision of the computer because uh, in some way he became, he has become the uh, authority on uh, on medical stuff, for example. So the risk is that uh, these systems uh, could really uh, the skill and the power, if you, if you like, uh, um, the authority of uh, medical people that are supposed to treat and to heal. So it's over. And sorry if I was a little bit longer. Uh, after coffee break, please, because we have to. Yeah, uh, there's a the window downstairs. We can have you believe. That's a good reason to. <laughs> so, if there is a question, where is, your... where is the coffee served? <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, you can. Uh, yeah, we can just have a discussion. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.